All right, so uh, thanks everybody for um, coming to, I think the fourth colloquium now this semester. Um, and today we're uh, very lucky to have Dr. Tarmara Ustalu, um, who's a full profess professor at uh, Raviek, or I, I think I, I, I was trying to listen to YouTube videos on how to say it before I started, but uh, I think I, I, I can't remember now that. Raviek maybe, is that correct, Tarmara? Reykjavik, yeah. Okay. Um, and uh, so Tomorrow's done a ton of really cool stuff in um, categorical logic and proof theory and uh, type systems, especially in the uh, area that I've been working in the last couple of years and uh, effects and co-effect systems. And, um, and today he's going to be telling us about skew X categories and structural proof theory. Um, so thank you, Tarmo, and I'll let you uh, take it from here. Thank you. Let me check again if you can hear me. Yep. Yes. Okay. Perfect. Um, so I'm very happy to have been invited. Um, excited about this topic. Um, I've got lots of material, but I can uh, tell as much or as little um, uh, <laughs> as we will have time for. And uh, um, I'm, I'll be very happy for questions. I'm just interrupt uh, at any point. It's it's not the goal to uh, to rush through everything. <clears throat> Yeah, for the title, I put skew X categories and st structural proof theory, where X is some sort of a placeholder for various things that you could put there. So I'm interested in particular in this talk in skew monoidal categories and something called skew prounital closed categories, but I'll also mention other things as we go. And this is based on joint works with uh, Nicolas Veltri um, in Tallinn and Noam Thalberg uh, uh, in Paris. So what's this about? It's, it's about proof theory um, and to a degree about category theory or category theory for certain things seen through the eyes of proof theory using methods that you take from proof theory having to do with sequent calculi, cut elimination or admissibility depending on um, how you want to look at it, focusing um, special uh, formats of sequence, uh, methods from proof search, etc. <clears throat> uh, okay, what is it about? Um, it's it's some sort of a re renewal of an old story, if you wish. So already at the end of the sixties, Lambeck, or in the sixties, I should say. Lambeck, Joachim Lambeck pioneered the study of monoidal categories, uh, which are categories with a very simple structure, something uh, resembling product that you call a tensor and some, something resembling a unit for that one. Um, monoidal categories, and he also studied residuated categories, um, which have a bit more structure so officially they are monoidal by closed categories without the unit or with. And he started to look at them with, with methods of proof theory, which was very, uh, very new at that point in time. Um, he was motivated from linguistics and grammars, and that's maybe uh, how he naturally landed there. But it opened up uh, uh, a whole new sort of perspective on how one could do things. Um, among other things uh, related to this, then he invented something called multi-categories that was directly inspired from proof theory, from se sequent calculus at that point. So something very amazing happened then, because doing all this work, he actually invented what people reinvented much later, namely linear logic in one particular flavor. So, so first of all, it was non-commutative. Um, a times B or A tensor B is, uh, is not isomorphic to B, B, B tensor A. Non-commutative. And it, it wasn't the full linear logic in the sense of Girard, but rather one was looking at the multiplicative things there. So we could say this was the beginning of intuitionistic uh, multiplicative non-commutative linear logic where I put intuitionistic in the parentheses because most of the time these fragments are so weak that you can't really tell any difference between intuitionistic and classical. And then 
several people picked it up immediately or, or did similar work at, at the same time, among them Loir, Mon, Zabo, Mintz, then many others followed. Uh, and, and this is all classical. But then in, in recent years, we, we've seen the discovery by Slachani, uh, a Hungarian algebraist, uh, of skewmonoidal categories. And then all of a sudden, a number of Australian researchers followed and started uh, looking at uh, these skewmonoidal categories, skew closed uh, categories, symmetric versions, etc. Different kinds of structured categories where a characteristic is this thing that we call skewness. I haven't yet said what skewness is, <laughs> but literally it means going in the sense of logic yet more substructural than linear logic, but maybe in a different way. Namely, uh, uh, it's not so much about throwing out structural rules like weakening and contraction, which linear logic does, <clears throat> But it's it's about throwing out other things. I'll I'll, I'll soon show. But 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 for example, uh, uh, one of the things that you could have is associativity only holds in one direction, and uh, I'll show you this uh, in a sec. Now, these categories with sort of very little structure, with very minimalistic structure, they're actually very subtle, and things like coherence theorems, which is sort of the exercise of combinatorially describing the free X category actually become very subtle and interesting and, and far more rich despite all of all, all this weakness than in the situation of, uh, of just normal monoidal as we call them or normal closed or normal monoidal closed, normal symmetric monoidal closed, whatever categories. So that is the motivation. There is the old story, old methods well, partially renewed because uh, today I'll talk a lot about focusing, which is a proof theoretic technique that is much newer than uh, what was considered in the 60s. It comes actually from linear logic context and was invited, invented by um, Jean-Marc Andreoli. But, but otherwise old methods applied to you know, new kind of interesting structures that now we find are interesting. And part of the interest of me in this, and maybe also of Harley, is um, many times uh, structured categories like these, sort of of skew variety, they arise from various constructions from uh, with monads and co-monads, and they are sort of the constructions that you would use in programming language semantics. Among, among other things, things like Kleisley categories, which are the place where you model effectful computation, for example. Um, so, so that much about the introduction. Let's then dive into the proof theory of these things. Um, I'll tell you, I'll, I'll start with, with skew monoidal categories. And then, uh, time permitting, I, I go to skew pro-unital closed categories, and I mention other things um, in between. And, um, well, I have to assume something, but I, I hope even if you don't have the full background, you'll, you'll maybe pick up some of the, you know, slogan words or some of the message, uh, even if the details will not be fully clear. But, but nonetheless, feel free to interrupt. But for now, is the agenda sort of acceptable? Uh, can we go on on this topic or you want something rather different? Uh, Looks good to me. Good, good, good with you. Okay, so we do that. Um, what are skew monoidal categories? These are something very similar to monoidal categories that many of you must have seen. But I'll, I'll, I'll give the full definition and then I give some examples. Uh, this was proposed in 2012, I think, by Slahani. Uh, it's a category together with a fixed object. Think like unit for a conjunction. <laughs> uh, and the functor, think like conjunction in linear logic. Uh, commutative, uh, uh, sorry, uh, multiplicative conjunction called tensor. And then there are some natural transformations, lambda rho alpha, that basically say the tensor is unital and associative. Uh, associative. Lambda for left unitality, rho for right unitality, alpha for associativity. But the peculiar thing is these are just natural transformations. So the components are maps 
in one particular direction. They aren't natural isomorphisms. So these maps are not generally not are generally not required to be invertible. So you're allowed uh, from, in the sense of logic, from A times B times C, you're allowed to conclude A times B times C with the parenthesis, parenthesis the different way around, move to the right, but then you cannot go back. Um, and similar for unitalities, you, uh, this might look strange because left unitality really looks like reducing, right unitality is expanding, but that's for some reasons the good way of doing things. Um, these ones will have to satisfy certain equalities that are written here in, in sort of diagram format. Um, and the curious thing is these are exactly the same ones that you have in the classical definition of one monoidal category, but in a monoidal category, these guys are required to be isomorphisms. MacLean originally, when he proposed monoidal categories, postulated all these five equations and then came Kelly and said, look, um, these are not independent and you actually only need two and three are redundant because um, they can be followed, uh, they can be concluded from the other two. In the skew setting, this is not the case. All of the five become independent. So this already shows some sort of a finer anatomy or something that perhaps surfaced from the proofs that McLean was playing with, um, but, but now is actually essential when you, when you work with a weaker structure. Um, <clears throat> So let's look at some examples of these that are relevant for us. The way I found um, uh, skewman oil categories was like this. I was looking at the generalization of monads actually motivated from programming semantics that wanted to be a bit more liberal than ordinary category theoretical monads, which are endofunctors with an additional structure. I wanted monads that would not necessarily be endofunctors. And then we invented such a thing and they actually play a, a significant role in certain exercises, but they are similar to monads being endofunctors in the monoidal category of endofunctors. Relative monads are monoids in a different place, but that other place is just only skew monoidal. So the construction is this, you start with the category C and uh, you want to make the category, here I see my first typo, you want to make the category of functors from J to C, um, a monoidal kind of thing, but it won't be, it will be skew monoidal. What you need for this, you need something replacing the identity functor. You need something to go between the two different categories, J and C. And if then it is the case that you can extend any functor from J to C along J, to get the functor from C to C, then you can actually compose functors from J to C, uh, composing G with a con extended version of F. And this J then, and this form of composition turns out to be a skewmonoidal structure and relative monads are the same as monoids in this skewmonoidal category. Here is another very simple example you, one can do. You start with any monoidal category. Actually, if you have some skewmonoidal categories around, you can start with a skew one like maybe this one. If someone gives you a lax monoidal comonad, not pre, it's not very important for the moment what, what lax monoidal means here, if you don't know, then you can do a trick. You can basically massage your given tensor a bit and define a different one. So A new tensor B is defined as A old tensor DB. And the fact that I require that the given category is skewmonoidal and that the co-monad is not an arbitrary one, but the lax monoidal one gives you that what you then get is this Q-monoidal category. You can do a similar thing with op-lax monoidal monad, um, and you get the, the correct version of skewness, which we actually call left skew. Everything today is left skew. If you, instead of multiplying together A and B in the tensor, multiply together T of A and B using the you know, given tensor. So that's one example. But there are also other types of examples. So for example, so here we, we, we took a category and which maybe was already skewed and we skewed it a bit more, or maybe it was normal and we skewed it. You can take a monoidal category or a skew monoidal category. And based on this, you can induce a monoidal structure 
on the Kleisley category. And here's how you do it. Uh, so um, you uh, have to use uh, A tensor B, and uh, this only works if the monad is particularly nice. So in the effectful world, uh, this corresponds to, to monads where you can reorder effects in a sequence. So I call it lax monoidal here, but another name for the same thing is commutative. So for a commutative monad, you can actually lift the tensor to the Kleisley category, and then what you do get is this Q-monoidal category. So these were just some examples. Um, now, um, let's go to the study of the proof theory of these things. So let's look at the free skew monoidal category. The free skew monoidal category, you can build from any given set of objects that you may want to consider as atoms or basic building blocks by just building a category that has at least these objects, but also all other mandatory objects, namely uh, some freely thrown in unit and tensor. And then you also freely throw in the, the, the least amount of maps that you need for this thing to be a skewmonoidal category. So essentially by definition of freeness, the free skewmonoidal category is something that you could very well describe by a deductive system that we here call a categorical calculus. There will be two kinds of ca calculi in the talk, categorical calculi and sequent calculi. This one is a categorical calculus. So in this categorical calculus, you work with a little uh, language of formula and they are in the sense of the free skewmonoidal category, they will be the objects. So the formula are um, atoms from a given set of atoms, the generators or the, the set on which we are taking the free skewmonoidal uh, category, then I, which is the unit, and then all these tensors or conjunctions. Yeah. Now, what is a map? Maps are derivations, but you identify quite a few derivations. Um, so they are derivations identified by some sort of an equivalence relation, or they are equivalence classes of derivations. Derivations of what? Derivations of simple sequence of the form A to C, where both A and C are single formula. Yeah? I'm using the word sequent here, but it's not yet sequence like in sequent calculus, where you have multiple formulae, perhaps on the left, one on the left, one on the right. And then what do we say are derivations? The derivations correspond to all maps that we minimally need to have. So the identities must be there for any two maps, their composition must be there. So that's a rule, looks like a cut rule. <laughs> when I've got maps from A to C, B to D, I must be able to get a map from A conjunction B to C conjunction D. And then there has to be these maps that correspond to unitality and associativity, but in one direction only. That's good. So these are all derivations. Can, can I ask if something? I all of these derivations as my maps, this is not the free skew monoidal category because many uh, of these derivations have to be equal by the laws uh, or by the equations of a, of a skew monoidal category. So I have to introduce an equivalence of derivations, which is the least congruence in, introduced by a bunch of equations. It looks like a whole lot, but they are the obvious ones. Well, the category equations must hold. Yeah, so if I cut something against an axiom, it must be the same thing. Uh, from whichever direction I cut, cutting uh, three things in whichever order is the same thing. Hey, uh, three Charles, say tensor is a functor. Then I have to say lambda rho alpha are natural. And then I have to say the five laws, the five equations of a skew monoidal category hold. Yeah, there was a question. Yes, can you hear me? Yep. Okay, can you go back one slide, please? Sure. So here you're saying A must be an atom, right? Oh, no, no. A don't, don't have to be atoms. A okay, but so for, are, are general formulae. Okay, but so for lambda rho and alpha, those A's could be complex formula. They don't have yeah, to yeah, be they, Yeah, of course, because lambda rho alpha, uh, I mean, they are natural transformations, so they, they must have components at every object, right? So okay. at every form. Okay, okay, thank you. Yeah, but uh, it's actually good to, to, um, to mention my lexical convention here. So X, Y, Z are always atoms. A, B, C are formulas, general formulas. Okay, okay. okay, we're good. That's nice. But um, then what about coherence? For monoidal categories, we know that between any two formulas, so to say, if we look at the free um, uh, monoidal category, for any two formulas, there will be exactly one um, equivalence class of derivations corresponding to exactly one map between them 
if there is one at all. And it's also possible that there isn't one. So that's Maclean's coherence theorem. There is a criterion for deciding if there is or isn't a map, but there is always at most one map. Here, the situation is far more different. First of all, there are, for example, no derivations like this, which by the way, correspond to the, to the, to the converse directions of the, of the unitality and associativity laws we postulated. And for example, we've got two inequivalent derivations uh, in these cases here, which actually correspond to, um, uh, to sort of cutting the loops that you see in, in these pictures in a different place. So I'm postulating doing this and this is identity, but I'm not postulating doing this and this is identity. And actually in the free skewmonoidal category, it won't be identity. And similarly here, there is a loop actually, as you can see, I've broken it here. I've stated this is an, action, this is an equation, but there is two other possible equations I could state. But since I didn't state them, it turns out, well, you have to argue, but, but it turns out that you really in the free Skewmonoidal category won't have maps uh, corresponding to these other ways of cutting these uh, loops, cutting this loop. Okay. Sequent calculus to rescue. Let's build the sequent calculus. Let's do it the Lambic way. Um, I'll modify the Lambic way, and I haven't told you what the Lambic way is, but I'll sort of explain as, as we go. So I hope everybody has seen a bit of sequent calculus for, say, classical logic. This is not very different. The differences are we are non commutative, so you can't you know, uh, move formulas past each other in the antecedent. And we are substructural, so contraction and weakening are never there. So um, here is a different deductive description then for the skew, free skew monoil category that I really call a sequent calculus. Sequence are not quite the usual ones. So we, on the right, we have a single formula that's usual. On the left, there should be an antecedent, but that uh, splits into two parts. There is something called a stoop, which is a formula or nothing, and there is a passive context, which is a list of formulas. So an optional formula together with a list of formulas. And the optional formula is separated out. You can't sort of coalesce it together with the rest. Now, what are the rules? The rules are here. There is an unit left rule. There is a, a tensor left rule. Look like good, but they only apply in this two position, nowhere else. Um, there is an axiom. There is a unit introduction on the right, unit right rule. There is times right. Times right splits context, splits the context like in linear multiplicative logic, multiplicative linear logic, with one exception. Um, well, you can't change the order. So it's good that all gamma goes to the left and all delta goes to the right. But why shouldn't I be able to move everything to the right? Well, you can if S is empty. But if it's not, if it's a formula, a stoop always has to go to the first premise. The stoop formula cannot be sent to the second premise. So these are the two important distinctions from the sort of standard case. And this is where the stoop is actually used to control anything. And then finally, there is a passivation rule. So because reading from top to down, it takes a formula from the active position to passive position. In proof search, of course, it looks like activation because proof search we do bottom up or root first then we actually move a thing to the, pass, uh, to the active position. But anyway, so you can always move the first thing from the context to the stoop. Yeah, okay. So it is a good sequent calculus in, 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 in good old ways in that by induction on proofs, you can show two forms of cut admissible. Now, what is the role of it? You want the sequent calculus to be sound and complete with, re with regard to the categorical calculus and for the completeness direction, you badly need to use cut, but cut is not primitive here. So I need that cut is admissible. Admissibility means not that the rule is sort of derivable as a simple package of rules, but by induction over derivations, you can, you can show that you can always make it. So if the premises are derivable, then the conclusion must be derivable. And this is concluded by inspection, inspecting actually what the proofs of premises are like. So there is a context cut where you cut into the context position, there is a, sorry, stoop cut, and there is a context cut where you cut into the context position. And in this case, the stoop of the first premise must be empty. So that's another restriction. And now uh, we had equivalence of derivations on, uh, uh, in the categorical calculus, there is also a similar thing here. I mean, in some sense, we have too many derivations. Some derivations, differ inessentially because, for example, 
maybe there was a choice whether to apply a right rule or a left rule, but it actually didn't matter which way we applied it because they kind of commute. So there is two kinds of um, equations we have to state. The first group are, are kind of eta things, which say you really need to never need to use the action um, on a, on a non-atom, because the action for i you can derive, and the action for tensor you can also reduce to the axiom cases for the, you know, for the two conjuncts in the tensor. So that's really eta. The other ones say you can always do left rules before right rules. And it goes like this. Um, and there is more to be said, actually. Left rules, uh, apart from passivation here, are invertible. But uh, it's far more than we can say at the moment. The important thing is that there is soundness and completeness. The two calculus really agree. And not only up to what is derivable, but <coughs> there are translations going between the two calculi, which preserve this respective notions of equivalence, right? Um, so I go from equivalent proofs derivations to equivalent derivations. Well, I have to relate, of course. So for a general sequence, I have to say what is the corresponding thing in the categorical calculus where I can only have single formula antecedents, but I can define this thing. Morally, you should take the conjunction of everything, but there is a bit more involved here. So first there is the question of what, what does the empty stoop mean? The empty stoop means I is a kind of an administrative I, which you don't write. It's kind of an I that you've already analyzed, if you wish. Otherwise, the stoop formula just means itself. So this is what a stoop means. Uh, then, I, uh, then the context acts on the stoop uh, in the following way. So A followed by a context actually means that you have to pile all of the context formulas on top of A with this particular parenthetization, all leaning to the left, not to the right. And by induction, you can define it like this. The empty context acts on A, just gives A, the, uh, B comma gamma is the same as applying gamma or ha having gamma act on A tensor B. Yeah. And then we get a precise correspondence, which is very, very nice. It is nice, but actually there is all this non-determinism here in this calculus. Can we do better? Can we actually, uh, because, you know, apparently, you know, when I could prove a thing like this, I can also prove it like this using these rules. Yeah. So all of these are kind of places of non-determinism. Could we get rid of it? Yeah, to a degree, at least this non-determinism that is captured here in these equations, we can, because we can see this equational theory as a rewrite system. So I can always, I, I never need to do anything like this because I can just as well do this. I can never need to do this because I can just as well do this. So let's make a strategy, for example, that I apply left rules first until I can. Well, there are subtleties here, but basically, and for example, also that I never stop here, but actually I go on. Yeah, I don't use axiom uh, at a composite formula, but I reduce it to simpler axioms. Um, ah, but I went too far. Um, sorry, this is my topic, but I first want to intuitively motivate why the stoop thing does the right thing at all. So let's, let's, let's look at this first. Well, it, it does the right thing at all because the stoop and the restrictions don't get in, in our way when I want to derive something corresponding to lambda rho and alpha. The corresponding sequence derivations are here and I won't read them out. Yeah. But the, the mechanism of the stoop and the restrictions associated to it make sure that I cannot derive anything that would look by its type like the inverse of lambda or the inverse of rho or the inverse of alpha. So for example, something like this is impossible. Why? Because the sole formula X of the antecedent is in the stoop. And the only formula I can apply here, the only rule that I can apply here is tensor right anyway. This forces me to split the context, but in an unfavorable for me way, I can only move the X here. But then I've got two hopeless premises, which I, sorry, the highlighting doesn't work. I'll just hover. Then I've got two high, uh, hopeless premises which I can't possibly derive, yeah, because you know I, I really need the x in the antecedent in the second premise, but it went to the first. So that's one place where this happens. Then I had this requirement that the unit left rule and the tensor left rule only apply in the stoop, nowhere else in the context. 
Now let's try to do the inverse, the, the converse of the, or the putative inverse of the right unit law. We would have to derive something like this. Well, I can clearly apply the times left rule. That's the only one I can apply here anyway, after I've proved that cut is admissible, uh, cut is admissible and this is sound and complete. So, I mean, oh, yeah. Right now, uh, depends on at which point you, you deal with, with cut, but let's, let's suppose we already know we don't need cut. So this is the only thing we can do. And now we're in a position where I is stuck in the context and I, I cannot apply the, uh, the unit left rule to it because it's in the wrong place. It's not in this two and I'm stuck. If I try to do associativity the wrong way around, what I would really like to do is as the next step, use tensor left uh, here in this context position, but I'm not allowed. It's only allowed in the stoop. That would allow me to, to, uh, to break up y tensor z into y comma z, and then I could split the context so that y goes to the first premise, z goes to the second premise, and I can conclude my proof. I can't do that. So I have to move all of y tensor z to either to the first premise or to the second premise, but either way, I've destroyed my life. Yeah, I can't continue. So this is what makes it tick. Now let's go to the focused fragment. So what's this? Um, yeah, so I, I already indicated that we can read the, the, the equations for the sequent calculus. They are much nicer than those for the categorical calculus. They can really be read as useful rewrite rules. And actually this rewrite system is really nice. It's locally confluent and it's strongly normalizing. So uh, these together actually give you that you actually have confluence and, um, uh, and unique normal forms. Then the question is, can we grammatically describe normal form derivations? Can we build a fragment of the sequent calculus where I cannot even look for anything non-normal? And the answer is, yes, I can. And that's the technique of focusing. I should really you know, distinguish the sort of phases of proof search. Here, I have to talk about sequence of two forms corresponding to two modes in which I can be. I can be in the left mode or right mode. So I can derive sequence like this or sequence like this, annotated with L and R for left and right. In left sequences, sequence S will be a general stoop. In right sequence, T will be a sort of a restricted stoop. Like as a stoop in general, it can be nothing or a formula, but here, if it's a formula, it can only be an atom. It cannot be a composite formula. It can't be a compound formula. Okay, what are the rules like? You work in the left mode using these rules as long as you can. Um, so it goes basically by, by, uh, by breaking formulas apart, tensors apart, removing unit, moving stuff here. But not quite. Actually, at any stage, you can say, I don't even apply passivation. I just use switch and I go to the right mode. And in the right mode, you're allowed to use the right times right, tensor right rule and the unit right rule and axiom. And uh, in the second premise of the times right rule, you get the empty stoop and here you go back to the left mode. Turns out these focused rules define a sound and complete proof system. But also, of course, they are a root for the first proof strategy because everything is pretty deterministic here. Actually, there is only two places where you have to choose. You have to either, so if you've got your stoop empty, then you can either use passivation or you can use switch because these ones don't apply. So that's in the L mode. I, I, I have to choose whether to passivate or to switch to the right mode. Another place where there is some real choice is how to split the context. And that seems to be, that's the resource gain in linear logic, right? I should decide who gets, who gets the fuel. And that's a critical one. Um, and actually it turns out these choices here are mostly inessential because looking at what is in the con uh, what is um, what the what the what the right hand side formulas are you see what you need so what has to go to gamma and delta but there can be a middle in the left hand in the context that consists of units and units are kind of irrelevant for derivations or derivability but you can choose to send them to the left or to the right and they actually give rise to different derivations that's a bit of what is happening here so there is Non-essential determinism here having to do with where you send um, um, formulas uh, that contain atoms, 
these are this is non-essential non-determinism but middle formulas here in a context that consist of closed formulas only only i and tensor no atoms they can go to the left and to the right and that's a real cho choice point okay um what we can say about the focused fragment is that we have this nice thing that uh, for every equivalence class in the general sequence calculus i have exactly one derivation in the focused calculus so the focused calculus is really great in that it picks out canonically for every equivalence class a representative in a systematic and sort of well-motivated way justified from root first proof search and you know looking for some idea of a normal form this gives you a practical coherence result so coherence is about finding out maps between uh, two formulas or say two objects in the free schema category um, now I can solve two algorithmic problems connected to coherence, and that really is what then coherence is about here. So to, to enumerate all maps from A to C, all I need to do is go to the focused calculus, find all focused derivations. They will correspond to different sequent calculus equivalence classes, therefore to different uh, categorical calculus equivalence classes. So I have to find all of these and just translate them back to the categorical calculus and I know that I do get the duplication free enumeration of all my maps. Yeah, were they zero, one, or many? Here it's not the case that it's zero or, or one. It can be many, as I already indicated. Then to compare two maps, I can also do a thing. So if I've got two maps given as categorical calculus derivations, they are the kind of syntax for maps. Then I can look at them and there is, it's very difficult to decide if they're equal just using the categorical calculus because it's so unwieldy. But what you can do is use these soundness and completeness result and the focusing result, translate the categorical calculus derivations into focus derivations and just compare them syntactically. Are these distinct derivations or not? Because if, if the maps belong to different equivalence classes, I will see now different derivations. If they were in the same equivalence class, they will, will map down to exact the same focus derivation is that fine so that is the sort of general gist and now i want to show more examples at a much faster pace perhaps and maybe not in detail but but this can be a machinery you know devise a sequence calculus um try to capture what is really going on what is the essence of the skew structure i mean this is clearly an art <laughs> and here for example this stoop mechanism turns out to be important and that's related of course, to, to something uh, foundational, which are called uh, skew multi-categories. So similar to like standard sequent calculus are related to multi-categories, then these sequent calculus with stoop manipulated in this particular form with a passivation rule, they correspond to something called skew multi-categories by Burke and Lack. Can, can I ask uh, something? So yeah. this is Cayman speaking. OK, so may, maybe you would get that at some point. Um, you said that cut was admissible. So that means you don't have a cut elimination strategy or do you have one? No, uh, when I say admissible, it really means that I have a, <laughs> have a very clear cut, cut elimination strategy. So uh, instead of eliminating cut, I show that cut is admissible, but this means I, I give a recursive procedure for uh, 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 th that defines cut. Um, okay. Okay, but so then if, if I give you the composition of two maps and then another map and I say, oh, they're the same, can you represent this one as a derivation, eliminate the cut and see if you find the other one and establish that the composition was the same at the other map? Yeah, yeah, you do exactly this. I mean, cut is not primitive. You use the actual definition of the cut uh, and you get a cut-free proof. You may need to focus it if it's still not in the focused calculus, right? Okay. So, so this translation here, I didn't comment on it, but, but, but this is also effective. So any focused calculus proof is obviously a general proof because mm -hmm. the focused calculus is just a subcalculus. Mm -hmm. But in the opposite direction, there is also, I mean, it's a procedure given by recursion on, on, on these derivations that takes a general sequence calculus and focuses it, right? It, it, it reorganizes it so that you're in the focused fragment. So yeah, everything is, is effective here. Uh, that okay, I so, so you can show that the diagram commutes using that too, actually. If I give you a diagram and we don't know if it commutes, you can just reduce them, I mean, interpret them, reduce the cut, and then see- uh, Exactly, yeah, yeah, sure. That is what it is. Yeah, of course. Okay, okay thank you.
because yeah, for any diagram, any diagram is after, <laughs> after all, just you know two paths around uh, around the diagram, right? So it's two maps with the same source and target. That's what the diagram is. Mm -hmm. You take the two maps, you translate them to these focus derivations using uh, using first completeness followed by focusing, and then you just compare the results. Yeah, okay. It's an effective procedure. Thank you. Okay. Thank you. So, Tama, would oh. you say that can I just ask? Would you say that uh, then what you mean by a coherence result is kind of an explicit description of the free, whatever it may be, on a set of objects? Is yes. That what kind of is that accurate? Yes, which is also synonymously an explicit description of everything uh, of something of, of everything that is valid in all, say, uh, skewmonoidal mm -hmm. categories, right? Uh, right. Okay. Yeah, that, that's my that's my definition here at least. So I'm looking for some sort of combinatorial description of um, of the of the free skewmonoidal category in this particular case. But let, now let's go to on to some other things that I'll do mo more tangentially. There is this cool thing called Partially normal skew monoil categories. So we've got we've got monoil categories where um, unitalities and associativity are isomorphisms, and then we've got the skew thing, where this is not required. But of course, we could go somewhere in between. I could be interested, for example, in in left skew monoidal, left normal skew monoidal categories. By which I mean I only require left unitality to be is an isomorphism. Or maybe right normal, by which I mean row is required to be ISO. Or maybe associative normal, also called Hopf, which would correspond to requiring alpha being uh, uh, ISO. Yeah. And there are examples of, of these cases. So, for example, this category, again, the typo is copied. So, this has to be a boldface J here of, of non lambda functors, the skewmonoidal one, is right normal. When J is fully faithful, it's left normal when, when precisely when J is dense, which is a technical notion means something called the nerve of J is fully faithful. And there is also uh, a characterization when this is associative normal. And there are other such examples. So for example, the one that I made, so I took a skew or maybe a non-skew monoidal category and I skewed it with a lax monoidal comonad. The result, for example, is right normal when when uh, when d is not just so this one wanted to say monoidal when d is not just lax monoidal but is monoidal but actually for this it already suffices when the sort of um, uh, you know the nullary witness of my monoidality is an isomorphism uh, so it's 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 less than monoidality actually but sorry there is another typo Look, these things occur but what about their proof theory we could do this thing and it turns out everything works beautifully. So if we could, for example, take the fully skewed categorical calculus, throw in an inverse for lambda, throw in equations saying uh, the inverse is really an inverse. That is already an interesting calculus. It's very difficult to work there. So for example, with, with some headache, you can find out that actually uh, one of these pairs of maps that I showed you were distinct in the, in the free skewmonoidal category are no longer distinct in the free left normal skewmonoidal category. Namely, these two guys are equal now. But how would you find it out? Very difficult to do. Much easier uh, if we had this uh, uh, sequent calculus machinery to help. Now, it turns out that left uh, normality corresponds precisely to extending the sequent calculus with a rule that actually allows you to move all of the context to the right. Remember this one? was the only thing that was uh, forbidden before when we split the context in the tensor right rule. Yeah. Now, and then we also need to throw in some more appropriate equations, of course. If you do this, then you figure out that the stoop actually becomes useless and you get an equivalent stoop reformulation where you still can uh, only apply uh, unit left and tensor left in the leftmost position but now it's not the position in the stoop, it's, it's just the leftmost position in the kind of general context. Because the stoop is unnecessary, you can freely move things in, in and out of the stoop. But actually this is sort of partial truth because this happens when you consider the free left normal skewmonoidal category on a set of objects. But if we rather started with some maps also given, so if we started with a multigraph instead of a set or a graph instead of a set, 
then it's not the case. The stoop will still be necessary, but that is still the correct extension. Um, and then one can do focusing. The idea with focusing now is uh, uh, I can actually restrict the switch from the left mode to the right mode to the case that when the stoop is empty, I only allow switching when gamma is also empty. So I refuse to apply switch when I could, in principle, apply passivation. So switch is restricted in this way. And then we could, this requires some further reorganization. We also have to uh, add the new uh, tensor right rule in the right mode. And what happens is, you notice previously we had two types of non-determinism. There was the choice of how to, type one non-determinism was the choice between passivation rule and switching. Type two was different options of splitting in the middle of the context for tensor right. Now, one of these non-determinisms goes away and that is precisely left normality. Right normality, similar, but surprises happen. So you can extend the categorical calculus with the obvious rule, just inverse of the right unitality. Uh, and then you say, state it's the inverse. Curiously now, and maybe, but maybe not surprisingly, because I've set up the plot in this way, you learn that one of the other ones of the previously distinct pairs of maps gets, um, uh, they, 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 they are the same map if you move from the free skewmonoidal category to the free right normal skewmonoidal category where more things are forced to be equal. So these in particular are equal. What does it correspond to sequence calculus? We first thought it, it corresponds to allowing unit left everywhere in the context. So not only in the stoop. And that was a mistake. We had a paper submitted and everything. And then when we formalized, we found out, no, 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 this is more subtle. You must actually allow getting rid of any closed formula in the context, if you want to have a cut free uh, and uh, adequate sequence calculus. So J and J prime and anywhere, J for me stands for closed formula, which are made of unit and tensor only. And I'm also allowed to break the tensor of two J's apart uh, anywhere. So you can also take the two rules together and you say any closed formula in the context can simply be thrown away, read bottom up, which is bizarre, right? Uh, so there are these, the, there is the real unit and there are all these pseudo units, which are the closed uh, formulas uh, that behave in some sense similarly. How do you focus this? Here is a trick now. You have to split the context into two parts. Uh, there will be um, um, a kind of a waiting room, an ante room, and gamma. And sort of in the waiting room, you, you have to put things that need to be sort of sanitized. Uh, and if we're done with them, then we move them over to gamma. And you start proof search then in the C phase, C for context. And the trick is you just move things from the left to the right. So whenever you see I in the anteroom, you can get rid of it, corresponds to a, a unit in, in the context. When you see something closed, you break it apart, keeping the same, so you keep breaking and uh, eventually you throw everything away. But if you see something that is not a closed formula, then you just move it to the other side. It's sanitized, uh, you know, without the further ado. And then finally, um, if your anteroom is clean, you've sanitized everything you needed to, you can switch. Now you can get more things to sanitize with the times left rule because this one breaks your tensor into two parts. One of them uh, is in the stoop, that's fine, but the other one lands in the anteroom and also needs cleaning. What this does is interestingly, now we have the fact that uh, in a derivation of a C sequent, which is every top level, what every top level derivation is, the involved R, L and R sequence, which appear later or higher up in the derivation, none of them have any closed formula in the context, which means that essential type two non-determinism, where you have to split where the middle formulas go, goes away. I mean, you've already dealt them before you even start to split. Yeah, this is a different kind of non-determinism that goes away. Okay, associative normality is in some way similar to right normality, in the categorical calculus, you throw in the obvious stuff. The curious thing is no new equalities between old maps can be derived. This is far from obvious. Um, but you can see it on the sequent calculus. How? The correct sequent calculus turns out to be the obvious one. You extend it with a rule that allows you to do 
tensor left anywhere in the context, not only in the stoop. In the focused fragment, you do kind of a similar thing uh, as we did in the right normal case. Now we put things in the anteroom and um, you know, no tensor can be moved to the passive context. They all need to be broken apart before they are moved to the passive context. So when I'm able to switch my gamma only consists of atoms and eyes. What is interesting here and what you can see when you think about it a bit is non-determinism is not reduced compared to the fully skewed case. And moreover, uh, the focus proofs are slightly different than that they were in the fully skewed case, but you can see that distinct derivations in the fully skewed focused calculus, they map still into distinct derivations in the associative normal uh, focused calculus. And that sort of shows that in terms of equalities between derivations, uh, this move was a conservative one. So surely we get uh, new things that are identified, but of the old things, we, we do not get new identifications. Um, and then one could, uh, curi uh, 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 yet nicer thing, one can do combined normalities. So one can, for example, define a parameterized focused calculus that handles any combination of left, right, and associative normality. What's good there then is uh, and what we should already know by what I've said is that the focused calculus for the case when I want to throw in left normality and right normality both, this reduces all essential non-determinism. So, I mean, there is still some choice about where to split the context for, for tensor right, but it's always the case that only one of the splits at all can be successful, uh, if even that, right? So there is never two different splits that can be successful. So we get that any two derivations here are equivalent or equal as maps in the categorical calculus. So this is a coherence result very similar to original MacLean's. So uh, when you uh, give up associative normality but retain left and right normality, you retain a MacLean type of coherence result that says in any home set in the free categories, there is uh, at most one map. This was noticed in the 70s, sort of in a different form and in a weaker form. So Laplace considered the case where the unit is not around at all. So he worked with a free skew semigroup category and figured out that you always only have at most one map in every home set. Is this good? Mm. So that was a tour de force. And there is no way that I can convince you of everything that is happening here. But I just want to emphasize that, that this sort of proof, proof theoretic machinery and especially the idea of, you know, write down the equations, see what you can uh, do with this equational theory as a rewrite system. Perhaps you, 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 you get a nice notion of, of, of normal, grammatically delineated notion of, of normal proofs um, is, 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 is very nice. Um, I wanted, uh, if I have like, how much time do I have? I only have five minutes, right? <laughs> Oh, you quick, uh, seven or so minutes, but um, like I said, if you go over slightly, it's fine. I, I'd be interested in hearing about the closed categories myself. Yes, but on the other hand, I'd, I'd be interested in getting some questions. <laughs> so I can also just uh, jump to the conclusion now. Maybe I'll mention a few things. Um, yeah, that's fine. <clears throat> so because, I mean, this was kind of a thing that I showed in detail and the, the, the other slides are far are not at all in, in this level of detail. So um, there is a notion of closed category that, that many people know, which is you have a monoidal category and then you have an adjoint to your tensor. But that's not the interesting notion of a closed category for me. That's what you should really call monoidal closed, right? But there is also the notion of non-monoidal closed where you only have the unit and sort of the right adjoint, kind of an implication around that we call lolly here. So it's like, a, a purely implicational logic with a unit that we want to do now in some substructural setting. So this has been looked at and Ellenberg and Kelly came up with this notion of a closed category and that's, that's, that's classical, that's standard. Now uh, there is a corresponding skew version of it which was fleshed out by Street a few years ago, maybe 2014 if I'm not wrong, actually based on some older notes of his but he sort of um, became interested anew in this thing after skew monoidal categories became a thing. 
So then, of course, skew closed categories were interesting. So what is that? It's kind of trying to do everything that we did before, but sort of massaging everything so that we don't see the tensor. And you can actually uh, massage rho, uh, sorry, lambda rho and alpha to some sort of combinators that don't mention tensor at all in the presence of the adjunction. And then what you do is you throw the adjunction away and just keep these combinators. And that's the trick. So you can, you can require these things, J, I, and L. These are classic names. I didn't invent them. Um, and they have to satisfy five equations that precisely correspond to the skewmonoidal equations. And actually, these combinators also correspond to right, left unitality, right unitality, and associativity one by one. So you could even choose to just only use a selection of them, not all three of them, but people don't do it. <clears throat> now, this is skew closed. Then what is, what is non-skew or what is normal closed? <laughs> normal closed should mean that these things have inverses. And this is where it goes slightly wrong. Um, so I lolly A to A being invertible so that you can go from A to I lolly A sounds reasonable, <laughs> but surely A lolly A sounds like a bigger function space than, than just I <laughs> in the general case, right? So it's not a good idea to invert this or this directly, but these combinators are, um, or net extra natural transformations are interdefinable with some more higher order ones, namely this and this. And if you, for example, look at this, which says maps from A to B have to be in one-to-one -one correspondence if this thing is invertible with uh, maps from uh, unit to A lolly B sounds pretty reasonable, right? So we instead require invertibility of this thing. J is uh, sorry, interdefinable with J hat. The, the right thing for left normality is require in invertibility of this. Uh, associativity is harder because it involves a co-end. Uh, you can require uh, an invertibility of this thing, and it's very cool, but it's slightly non-standard. So Eilenberg and Kelly, when they invented closed categories, they didn't require L hat to be invertible, but uh, Brian Day considered this, actually. So we would call this associative normal, and that's far more difficult to analyze. So one thing to learn is, Closed categories a la Eilenberg and Kelly are not even uh, normal. They are already skew, but they only skew in the associative aspect. So there are some examples of these, and I just wanted to sort of illustrate from where they come. So you can do various things. So for example, when you've got a closed or a skew closed category, you can take a lax closed commonad. You invent your own um, internal home, which is defined with the help of this commonad like this, and you've skewed your closed category if it wasn't skewed before. Yeah, for example. But there are cooler things. So for example, you can start with a closed or a skew closed category. You can have a left strong, also known as internally functorial monad. And then if you define, this is another typo, <laughs> um, uh, lolly like this, where this is lolly. So B lolly TC is B lolly TC. And you also define this um, as a functor um, on the Claisley category, or as a contravariant um, mixed variant functor uh, on the Claisley category, then you do get that the Claisley category is skew closed. So that is something interesting, right? So uh, this is a thing that you can always say about the Claisley category uh, as, as a particularity of the function space. It's skew closed. So there is more. Uh, <laughs> So for example, if you start with a closed or skew closed category, if you take left strong monad, previously it was right, sorry, what is happening again? You take a right strong monad, more typos, then you can get a skew closed cat category out of the category of algebras, namely TI has a canonical algebra structure and you can also equip any internal home B lolly C with an algebra structure inherited pointwise from the algebra structure that you must have had in on, on C if you were in the category of algebras. And that's a funny internal hum where notice you do not even require that these that the elements in here are homomorphisms. So um, externally, you work uh, uh, maps here 
or, or, or a home set consists of homomorphisms, but the internal home doesn't consist of homomorphisms, but is but is but it's sort of more liberal. Um, Alch T nonetheless is Q closed, even in this strange setting, and it's right normal if the original category was right normal. Now, if Lolly preserves equalizes in the covariant argument, and your monad is not only left strong and right strong, but it's actually commutative, it lacks closed. Then you do get a skew closed structure on algebras when you actually cut down this lolly we had before to homomorphism. So it's kind of the correct internal home object. And then the category is both left and right normal if the original is left and right normal. So it's a much better behaved case. And actually the whole situation was sorted out in the non-skew sort of Allenberg Kelly situation where you require both left and right normality in, a, in, a, in an old paper by 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 Koch, but since he of course didn't consider sort of fully skew closed categories at that point, he couldn't even consider this example with a poorer or sort of more with a stranger notion of an internal home that allows non homomorphisms. Uh, okay, uh, you can do slightly weirder things. Um, so think lambda calculus in lambda calculus, type lambda calculus. We have a function space. But we don't have a unit um, normally. Maybe in the semantics, you often want to have a unit because you want to talk about context. And then maybe you say, OK, a context is, after all, a product. And then the nullary case is a unit. And it looks like you need unit anyway, perhaps. But, but surely, you don't need any of this, <laughs> maybe. So and, and this is the approach of skew pro-unital closed categories. So that's a beast that was invented by Schulman. And the trick is to throw out the unit uh, sort of in its full uh, generality, but keep it there in a shadow form. So morally, unit is allowed on the left, but you cannot write it. <laughs> uh, so top level on the left, the unit is allowed. So formally, you model it like this. You've got your ordinary lolly. Um, but then you also have this extra functor called J, which goes from C, your category, to set. And you think of it as kind of the element set functor. So, you know, instead of the home set, you can also talk about the element set. <laughs> and if the unit is around, J is nothing else than Yoneda at one, or Yoneda at the unit. But now it's not around. So I just postulate J. Then I can still talk about J, I, and L. Uh, and they satisfy some equations that precisely correspond to the skew equations. And you can also speak about left normality and right normality and associative normality. But right normality and associative normality then become more complicated because, again, you talk about invertibility of some extra natural transformation where, yeah, depending on which end you start, where, uh, where the domain uh, is actually a co end. Yeah, rather than anything simple. So Schulman only considered left normality, but you can go fully skew. And Schulman considered left normality for exactly the same reasons that Eilenberg and Kelly didn't consider associative normality. It gets unwieldy uh, um, under, you know, with respect to certain criteria. Uh, um, maybe, and now my time is really out, but maybe I should give you an example of this and just claim that we did the proof theory because the example I think is very, very cool. Um, so, uh, did you always think that when you did semantics of lambda calculus that you need a Cartesian closed category for it? Like, uh, it looks like you need function space, but then for context, you maybe also need uh, the unit type and product. That's at least the standard way of talking about things. But surely maybe you shouldn't need the context with the product because you should be able to carry the whole thing, right? Uh, so instead of saying like, uh, a1 times blah, blah, a n at o c, I should be able to say a lolly, blah, 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 more things, lolly c. So carry everything to the right, except uh, maybe the first thing uh, on the left. So that should be OK. So why, why cannot we do this? And it actually turns out that there are properly uh, sort of uh, pro skew, pro unital models of lambda calculus where where literally 
the unit is not around, the tensor is not around, still you can do lambda calculus. I mean, you, what do I mean by not around? I don't mean not around in the syntax. I mean, they are not even there in the semantics. Like there isn't a left adjoint to your lolly. So here's the trick. Uh, I, I stole it from the shipper, uh, from an old book on symmetric closed categories. So consider the skeletal category of finite sets and functions. So uh, the objects are cardinalities and uh, uh, the maps are functions between the corresponding cardinalities. This is a very nice category. It, it's, it's Cartesian. So your, your tensor is a product. Well, then of course it's symmetric. So it's a symmetric monoidal closed category. Now let's throw out some cardinalities. I only want to keep cardinalities from this subset M that is defined inductively. And what I keep there is three, which is my favorite number, and then N to the power of M for all little m and N that are already there. So notice one is not there and three times two is not there. Sorry, three times three, which is nine is not there. So we have clearly lost the original unit and the tensor, which are one and times here. But we have the internal home, n to the power of m. Yeah, OK. So maybe for this internal home, I can find another unit and tensor. OK, a lot is lost. It won't be uh, like, surely it won't be Cartesian closed anymore, but that maybe I can go monoidal closed. But you really cannot, because you need these things. Um, 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 in a in a monoidal closed category. And, and this just doesn't work out anymore. <clears throat> so so for, for, for in particular, you would really need that you have three and three around because it's okay to consider uh, maps from three to uh, three to the power of three, for example. But then when you uncurry, it has to be three times three, but that we don't. So this is pure unital closed in the sense of Schulman. Now you can do a trick. You can skew it. We know actually what we how we can skew these things. So um, I can use a left strong monad. I, I told you that this works for skewing closed categories. You can also skew a pro unit a closed category like this. So um, uh, uh, so let's skew the thing. It suffices to actually work with them with any left strong monad. So I can take the reader monad m to the constant k for some k, for example, three again. And now I'm in the Claisley category of t. And this one, actually, this construction loses, going to the Claisley category loses the left normality. So now I'm properly skew pro unital closed. So that's a funny thing to do. Um, actually, you could do kind of an intermediate thing as well. I could throw out less. I could just take m to be all natural numbers, but remove 0 and 1. <laughs> Already then, I clearly use my, I lose my unit. And you can check that what you get is a pro unital monoidal closed category. So I've got a monoidal structure, closed structure, but the unit is there only in the shadow form. And then I could just skew it in, in the same way as before. So now I can maybe take m squared because two is also an allowed number and I do get a skew pro unital uh, closed uh, moment. So I had an example of the categorical calculus here for the skew pro unital closed. Let's not go into the detail. I can tell you what the surprises are. The surprise are um, you do the calculus, you think you would get a calculus where lolly left rule only applies in the stoop. And then it turns out, yes, this suffices and cut is admissible and that's already complete. But you happen to have that because cut is admissible, from cut you can derive that, uh, that you can apply lolly left anywhere in the context. So therefore, using lolly left anywhere in the context is also admissible. So that's a surprise. It looks like, what? I wanted to restrict the lolly left rule. Now all of a sudden I, I got it back anyway through the back door. It gets worse. Embarrassing is simply one can show that the, the inverse of a passivation that we can call activation is, is admissible and it's, and it's really inverse. I mean, if you take the recursive definition of it, you can, you can prove by induction that uh, that the isomorphism round trips they they hold so uh, and and invertibility of this guy corresponds to invertibility of lambda so the free skew pro unital closed category is left normal yeah i didn't build in left normality but i got it 
Uh, the surprise about it is, this is, first of all, we found this is very strange. Another thing is we try to prove it directly on the categorical calculus, we still cannot do it. It looks like sequence calculus is the only place where you can see things clearly enough. Now, what does it mean? Does it mean that every skew pro-unital closed category is by some magic left normal? No, that's not the case. Already when we throw in some maps before we do the, the generation of the free skew pro-unital closed category, then we do not get left normality. So it's only the fact that we started from a set of objects that gives us this. Also, left normality is, is lost when you have more things around. So if you, for example, don't do the free skew pro-unital closed category, but you do the free skew pro-unital monoidal closed category. So you explicitly want tensor, lolly, and you only want unit in the shadow form where it can only appear on the top level in the left. <laughs> then also you lose left normality. So it's this particularly weak setting that gives us this coincidence and it's really a coincidence. Takeaway, as promoted already by Lambach and others that followed them, proof theory is a very useful tool for studying problems of coherence. So like combinatorics of these free structured categories, this is how I interpret it here. And also like uh, algorithmic problems related, like determining equality of maps or figuring out how many they are. Focusing is one particularly useful technique. And then another takeaway is you would think that we've now taken the, you know, the, we've gone so substructural that you can't possibly go lower, right? That is, that is, that is more substructural than linear logic. That is more substructural than non-commutative linear logic. This is ultra substructural. You think nothing can happen here, but actually coherence is super subtle and full of surprises. And then proof theory and proof assistance, they allow you to find these out. Okay, sorry to have gone so much over time, but now I've really completed. Yeah. No, I think it was great. Yeah. Um, does anyone have any uh, questions? Uh, yeah, I've got some questions. Um, first of all, could you? Uh, thanks for the talk. Really interesting. Could you? Could you go back to? First of all, could you go back to where you had the monads? It was very early on where you showed that Claisley category, a Claisley category is skew, is skew monoidal. I just went past a bit quickly, so I didn't get the chance. Yes. Yeah. Yeah. Okay. That only works because I'm using a lax monoidal monad. Not a lax monoidal functor, not... Uh, yeah, so there, there is, there is this, this is literally the same thing as a commutative monad. Yeah. Otherwise, you're in the pre-monoidal uh, world, right? Uh, Glasley T right. doesn't have any reason so in these terms, say. <laughs> okay, so I'm a bit surprised because I thought the Claes, if you take a, if you take, if you start with a monoidal category, you take a commutative monad, you take the Claesley category, isn't that going to be monoidal? Or am I missing something? Like literally monoidal, why, why is it skew monoidal? Isn't it? Um, maybe, I'm, maybe there's a subtlety here. Um, I'm sure there is. Uh, I copied from the paper where the subtleties are written out. So we've also said what happens to each of the normalities. One thing is for sure that you can, maybe when you start with a fully normal thing, you get back a fully normal thing. Off the top of my head, I cannot say. I could sort of go back to the paper and check. But one thing that is sure that is sort of more than you normally know is that you can already start from a skew monoidal thing. Right, then you okay. Thing back. Yeah. Okay, 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 I see. Um, right, so that was one question. Uh, another question, right? If you if you take the case where the associator is an ISO, right? Mm -hmm. You could consider. I mean, it was, I think I think I heard something like this. Maybe pe other people considered where you have you could um, have the unitors going both outwards or both inwards. I mean. Because once once you know the direction of the associator, that kind of determines the direction of the unitors in a very obvious way. But if the associator is an isomorphism, then it's kind of you could consider these other two possibilities, which are not covered so by use, uh, rather Pardon? than one hand. Yes, yeah, exactly. Is that something you considered, like for? for... We didn't consider this uh, in these games at all. But I know that this kind of structure has been relevant for a number of people. Um, like I, I know for Marco Grandis in something, I think. I think also uh, when Marcelo Fiore was playing with um, skew semi ring things with, I think, Philip possibly, Saville. 
then he had this thing where uh, the unitors uh, went in the same direction in the sense that they were, for example, both reducing or both expanding. Uh, Okay. But I haven't played this this kind of a proof theory game for this situation at all, and I know nothing about it. Uh, okay, but, but you're saying there are like examples where of such things. Like there are examples. there are non-trivial examples of such things, indeed. Yes. Right, but but the ones that people are interested in. I mean, I don't just be contrived examples just to show they exist, but you know. Uh, what counts as a contrived example? The the example with, with number three was contrived, or is it natural? <laughs> <laughs> um, <laughs> Um, right, so, so yeah, more metal than, say, than so, shall we say. Uh, okay, they, they thought they, they, it, examples they found to be interesting. So, yeah, um, yeah, they, 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 they really did just relevant. they did construct them just to show that they exist, right? No, no, no. I mean, uh, they, uh, okay. they, they, they had these examples and they were looking for the name of the thing. So, uh, okay, motivated um, by some, some examples right. that really popped up somewhere. Okay, I had two more questions, I think, if that's okay. Um, the next question is, so you've got these focused proofs. Um, it's a bit of a long shot and the answer is probably no, but is it possible to see these focused proofs as being strategies in, for some kind of game model? Like in some yes, cases where you have focused proofs. Shot, but I suppose that could be the case. But I'm, I'm, I'm really, uh, Paul, you would know this, I'm really weak in... Uh, Game semantics. Uh, okay, I just, just wonder because you know sometimes focus proofs can be seen as strategies. I mean, you have to. Say, I, I'm not saying it can here. I wonder whether all the multiplicative stuff makes it harder to to see it in that way. But you have got this some kind of alternation as you move up the tree, right, between two yeah. players. So it, it's it's a it, it could be a fruitful way of thinking about it, but maybe it isn't. It it could be, and Noam is very much thinking in these terms, and he's sort of. He always tries to make sense that everything you know works well with, say, polarities, negative, uh, positive things, mm -hmm. sort of in the French sense of the word, rather than the trivial one, whether you're, whether something is covariantly somewhere or contravariantly. Um, um, it's not so. So I think there could be something, but honestly, I can't say anything meaningful. Okay. In this Okay, and then the last question. So you talked about these. What was it? Pro unital closed. Uh huh. Is that, does that base correspond to a closed multi category? I, I talk about the, the Shulman sense, not, I'm not talking about skew for the moment. In the, is the Shulman thing that you mentioned, does that oh, equivalent no. um, to a closed multi category? Is this? I can maybe go to the right place. So, closed multi categories in the sense of Manjuk, they correspond to. Huh? I don't know who's defined. I, I mean, I don't know who's defined closed multi-category, but I kind of there is a tag paper by um, by Manziuk, maybe like ten years ago. Okay. That precisely tells the same story as Hermida, like the connection between you know monoid categories versus representable multi-categories. So it's a similar story, but right. for closed and uh, what are then called closed multi-categories. Uh, so, uh, but but well, here, what, what Schulman did was was slightly different. So. Uh, I think pro-unitality has also an effect in the um, uh, in the story if you wanted to connect to multi-categories directly. But I, I would have to think five minutes to give a qualified answer. Mm -hmm. But it's literally about, um, so maybe I should, maybe the quickest way to answer this is what it is in terms of sequent calculus. So already in the categorical calculus, what happens is that you can sort of think of two kinds of maps. There are like maps between objects properly. Yeah. But, but there are also these, these kind of maps that you can think of as global elements. I mean, I, I, you right. would normally write them I arrows C. I mean, the okay. unit, but the but unit is not present. So you can just leave you, it out. Okay. But you need, you can't, so you've got nullary and unary maps, so to speak. Exactly. Yes. But you need. But you're saying that you need the unary ones. You can't just. I mean, it's not the case that the unary ones suffice. Sorry, the nullary ones suffice. Ah, that is subtle. No, uh, and I didn't put it on the slide. So in the case of symmetry, uh, you, you you do the real thing. You get like you know a, a Hilbert axiomatization of implicational logic, if you wish. Right. Everything is on the right hand side. Mm -hmm. But in the ah, but actually this is visible here. But in the in the in the absence of symmetry. Uh, you can't actually have a version of I, which is sort of um, 
one-sided only, you will need something that is, uh, that is, um, am I telling the right thing? No, I'm not telling the right thing. Sorry, mixing up. So in the left normal case, you can move everything to the right-hand side, of course, yes? Yeah. Mm -hmm. So, and that, that is what you get when you start with a set of atoms uh, rather than a, a sort of a multigraph as a basis for your multi-category. Um, uh, Even without the, symmetry. Everything to the right. You can really move everything to the right because- That doesn't require symmetry. That doesn't require symmetry. Okay. But there is a different thing. What is the different thing that I wanted to say? Ah, normally you can put everything in combinators, right? So you basically have just uh, modus ponens and combinators by which I mean, you know, simply maps, no rules. Your only rule would be modus ponens in the system. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. But in the absence of symmetry, you will need, even if you move everything to the right, in addition to modus ponens, you will need one more rule, which is this rule I that you, I'm showing here right now with the left-hand side also moved to the right. <laughs> I see. So it would say, you know, like A, you know, or like, uh, what is it? Turnstile A gives you turnstile A lolly B parentheses lolly B. Okay, I mean, that's, that so, seems uh, okay. There's nothing whereas special with symmetry, about you can get rid of that and, and, and then, you, then, you're, then you're actually back at BCI. So this is kind of a replacement for BCI in the case uh, where symmetry is not there. Uh, Okay. Okay, thanks. That's all my questions. Hey, uh, there was a question online for you. I'm just going to paste it in the chat so you can just uh, read it. Facilitate a categorical proof that the singly type lambda calculus. Yes, I think so. So that's kind of a similar game because, um, well, we, here we were in a non-Cartesian setting, right? But if we uh, if we actually are uh, uh, if we have a Cartesian non-monoidal closed category and we're interested in the axiomatization, this is uh, this is a very similar story. And I think, yes, you can, you can get a categorical proof that the simply type lambda calculus is equivalent to the type SK calculus. This is already very similar to, the, to what I have here, right? So uh, this is BCI, basically, where instead of one of the combinators have this funny one. I mean, provided everything is moved to the right-hand side. But then weakening and contraction allow you sort of further replacements of some combinators, some combinations of combinators with other combinators. And if you play a few of those, you can uh, replace your three combinators with just two, which are S and K then, uh, which then suitably also uh, uh, incorporate weakening and contraction. That's, that's very true, uh, but we've not gone in the Cartesian direction at all yet, which is also very, very interesting. Um, yeah. Uh, um, regarding uh, what Paul was asking about earlier, Gnome is, watching via YouTube and he had said on the chat that uh, um, that closed multi-categories do correspond to abnormal pro initial skew closed categories and that was Shulman's original interest. Uh-huh, okay. Okay, thanks. So I got that one wrong. Uh, yeah, yeah, okay. Thanks. Yeah. So thanks uh, to them for that. Um, but but no, now I have a question, Noam. <laughs> Did I get anything else wrong? <laughs> <laughs> yeah, we'll pause because there's a slight delay uh, going to you. So. But he's not here. We'll, we'll, we'll see what he says. Yeah. Um, one, one question I had. So you had said if you parameterize uh, the system, you can do like multiple versions. It, by parameterize, you just mean like just adding a little thing for like being left or right or... Um, oh, yeah, yeah. So this would be like a sequent calculus um, that operates on three bits. Like, do I want left normality turned turned on or off? Do I want right normality turned on or off? Do I want right, okay, I normality that. turned on or off? And a few of the rules in the calculus actually, you know, ask: is the bit set or not? Uh, yeah, yeah. You might be. I was thinking that you might be able to do that with with sort of a junction. So if you had like, uh, if you think about like. Um, adjoint logic if you have sort of you move to the to the uh 
to the left, then you have like sort of more structural rules. And so if I have more of them, I can kind of uh, build, uh, uh, obtain an adjunction, and get modalities to do the same thing. Uh, Noam said the talk was very nice. So. Mm -hmm. Yes. I don't know. I mean, there are all sorts of questions now also related to, uh, I'm not sure if it's related to a question or not, maybe a bit related to this uh, uh, adjunction between uh, the tensor and the, uh, and the lolly, mm -hmm. right? So, uh, yeah, we, 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 which you can describe as, as a natural isomorphism between sort of curried and uncurried versions of, of maps. Uh, now, if you if you insist on uh, so if you work with something that is say skew monoidal closed, yeah. um, then the moment you turn on say right normality for your lolly, this turns on the right normality for your tensor. So I mean they 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 really aligned, yeah. and yeah. Uh, and similar for associ associative normality, right? So uh, uh, the the closed categories of Allenberg and Kelly they don't require associative normality. But associative normality actually holds in any old monoidal closed category. Uh, right. Yeah. Another place where associative normality holds are these funny ones where um, you have a bi closed structure. So you have both a left lolly, which is the only type of lolly I've, I've talked about here, and the right lolly. And uh, then they are sort of connected by this sort of double adjunction where a middle bit is missing. Actually, you go through the, <laughs> you go through the, uh, the tensor that is not there. Uh, if this one also, uh, uh, yeah, so, so, so sorry. So if, if, if you've got two lollies, they are connected by this kind of a condition, which is like going through uh, the adjunction through the tensor and then back, but the, the tensor is missing on the way. Uh, if this, this relationship holds between the, the two lollies, then you get the similar thing. So the, uh, the normality, associative normality of one gives associative normality of the other and left and right unitalities like this, etc. cetera. Mm. And there is the interesting story in Eilenberg Kelly. So he, in their original Eilenberg Kelly theorem, there is not a perfect uh, match between say, an adjoint uh, tensor and lolly or parametrically adjoint, or yeah, uniform, whatever we call it, naturally adjoint uh, right. tensor and lolly, because he works with associative normality for the monoidal structure and the associative normality is not there for, for cl closed structure. And then he gives the condition that for the closed structure to get an associative structure, you require something else. And that actually looks like uh, the, uh, the adjunction sort of in an internalized form also holding as an isomorphism. Right. And, um, and that is also related to sort of on one hand associativity for lolly, associativity for tensor, and then this kind of a middle condition stated in terms that involve both tensor and lolly, they are all equivalent. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Uh, that's kind of what I was thinking about. So there is lots of little things there that are sort of nice. Uh, overall, mm -hmm. I want to say this is, this is all kind of reverse mathematics and engineering, right? So I want to know for everything, what are the minimal conditions now, right? Yeah, yeah, yeah. To get this thing constructed right normal, how much normality do I need in my original category that I started out with, for example? And, uh, you can mm -hmm. ask all these questions for these little constructions with monads and commonads. Mm -hmm. Can I ask another question? You said that the people had studied symmetric versions of these things. Like, what can you give an example? Because I, all the things I think of don't seem remotely symmetric. Um, no, I didn't look, we didn't look into symmetric things at all yet. Um, um, but but Urki and Lack did. And so there is a good notion of a skew um, monoidal, skew symmetric monoidal category. Okay, so they must and, have examples or they wouldn't have studied it. And there, there are, you, you, can, you can think of examples. Uh, I'm not sure if I can think of examples of my kind with monads and commonads, but um, but what you there basically do is is a bit like allowing exchange in the context, but you can't um, you can't uh, move uh, you know you can't swap uh, two things where one comes from the context and the other one from the stoop. Uh, yeah. Right. Mm -hmm. Okay. Uh, okay. Mm. Okay. 
Mm. And, and 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 then they tell uh, the symmetric story, and they also have a Brady story, I think. So, mm. so, symmetric and Brady. Okay. Awesome, great. Um, well, I think uh, we can uh, finish up here, and uh, thank you so much again. That was a great talk. I really enjoyed it and learned a bunch. So, so um, th thanks a lot for your time. Sorry for planning my time badly. Sorry for all the stupid typos uh, on the slides, of which fine. I counted like four or five now. Maybe yeah. there were more, uh, but I hope hey, I got the gist yeah. across. I'm very sort of enthusiastic about the material, and I, I hope to find out more. And I invite you to uh, sort of join on the ride. <laughs> yeah, yeah, yeah. No, it, it's great. It was super interesting. I'm excited to to uh, to read about your your future results. So, yeah, Paul, thank you. Question for the neighbor. <laughs> yeah, thanks. Thanks also for all questions. Yeah. Yeah. Clement Abar asked, can I ask something? Right. Did, 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 sure. did he actually ask? Yeah. yeah. That, but that no, was... no, that, that's an old that's an old. Well, that method. was during the talk, yeah, you know. I see. About yeah, the yeah. Axioms in the rules. Okay, th thanks for your time, really. I, I enjoyed it. And uh, yeah. Yeah, thank you. But thanks right, for the thank invitation. Well. Right. Thanks. Cheers. See you. Thanks for the invitation, <laughs> Holly. Yeah, it went terribly badly over time.